Hello everybody and welcome to our live chat for the third Sunday of every month. Um, today we're going to be discussing value contrast and how the way you handle value contrast de determines uh, the result of your painting, how your painting is expressed and how your, your viewers are going to see your paintings. Uh, before we get started, give everybody time to come in. Uh, before we get started, I want to just remind you that um, the, the live chat itself is open to everybody. Uh, whoever happens to log on gets to watch. The, only the members, uh, the Studio Insider members, can ask questions. And so Studio Insider members also get every month a free video lesson and other little perks too so if uh, you would like to, if you're not a Studio Insider member and you'd like to join we'd be happy to have you with us uh, all you gotta do is hit that join button and uh, answer the questions and oh yeah by the way you pay $4.99 a month but that's minimal considering that you get a free video every month and you get to ask questions all that good stuff so hello everybody happy summer solstice Anne and hello Cheryl Saren Laura Krista, Christina, Joni, everybody else too. All members. Uh, all members. <laughs> I get to say hello to members by name if I see them. Um, so, we're going to get, get going pretty soon. Uh, going to follow the same format that we've been following now for some time. And that is we'll begin by showing you a short video about whatever our concept is. This time it's a short video about value contrast and maybe some surprising things for uh, I just did a workshop on value contrast. I see some of you, uh, some of the ones who are in the live chat uh, also attended the workshop. Anyway, um, yeah, so you should be well ahead, way ahead of the game. Um, we, uh, I, I think you might be surprised at the what what's really involved in handling value contrast in your paintings. So we'll begin with the video. Uh, if you have questions, well, if you if questions come to mind while the video is playing, um, either put, go ahead and put them in the chat, or if you if you if that's going to distract your attention from the rest of the video, jot it down and then throw it in the throw it as a question in the chat uh, when when at the other end of the video. So, are you ready, Roger? Okay, so here comes the video. Contrast means a compared difference. We might have two values side by side that are considerably different from each other, or we might have two values side by side where there is a difference though it's not a really, really strong difference, or we might have two values side by side that are different, but just slightly different. Being able to recognize those degrees of difference and how we can use them uh, as we create our paintings is what this lesson is all about. Generally, we can communicate those degrees by grouping them as major, where there is really a strong difference between the values, and that is a continuum. It's not just one kind of difference, but there are several, or you might say a continuum of differences where uh, they are stronger. And then uh, uh, this, the next difference we might call moderate, where the differences between the two values are discernible, and relatively strong, but not as strong as what we would call major. And they can be within any range, uh, dark to light, middle to dark, dark, middle to light, any range. But when they are moderate, where there are not extreme differences between the two values, we can call them moderate. And then when there's a real close difference, they're different, they're not really different. There's just a little bit of difference between them in their value contrast. We could call them minor. Notice what your eye does here. This is from a painting by Thomas Moran. 
notice how your eye goes here first or did your eye go there first my bet is that you did now there's really no strong value of contrast in this piece as we're seeing it right now you can see right here you have minor value of contrast barely an interval between this value and this value and as you look all in this area you see how close the value contrast is the strongest value contrast is right in here and it's really not very strong at all it's more like a moderate value contrast and yet because this is the strongest value contrast this is where our eye will go first now let's make a slight change and notice now pay attention to what your eye does when I do that now your eye jumps why did your eye jump because the value of contrast is greater now you might say well the color changed true the color did change but you wouldn't you would notice it if it were black and white the color does make a difference but what we're studying is how the value contrast influences the color uh, without the value contrast or without the differences in contrast you don't see those differences in color so much the value contrast and the color work together so it's the value contrast we want to focus on but you notice here now in this area we get a, a, a um, more intervals a stronger more like a couple of intervals but intervals between this value and this value more like a moderate moderate to minor you might say value contrast right in here and it's still it's almost the same value contrast as this the this and this are almost competing for attention not quite because there's more of this than there is of this but as your eye moves through it Let's look at the difference now between what your eye is doing between this and this. Between this and this. Simply because we changed the value contrast. Now let's change the value contrast again. Now look what your eye does. Your eye jumps in a totally different direction because more contrast has gone in this area right in here in this area right down here this has become a little more contrasting and in this area right back here so now we get stronger contrast between here and here and we're not noticing this right in here quite so much we've got contrast here uh, we've got this about the same degree of contrast here as we have here as we have here and so now our eye is moving more like this now that's what value contrast will do the greater the contrast the stronger the eye is drawn to it and when several uh, contrasts are placed or when value contrasts are placed in several places over a painting then the eye is moving from one to the other and the degree with which the eye is moving or the speed or interest you might say with which the eye is moving is determined by how much contrast is there and how much how many things are being contrasted now let's change that contrast again ah now we have something totally different in fact what we have now is a, a Moran's actual painting and you can see now we have a strong value of contrast we have a dark really strong dark here against this light light here this is more like a major value contrast as is this even though we have this gradation between them we have a stronger value contrast here even much stronger back in here and here now the intervals there are more intervals between this dark and this light than they are let's go back now and let's pull let's throw that back like this you can see I changed the intervals by making this lighter then we have not quite not so many value intervals between one value and another so now your eye is going back to be more interested in these areas but then when I take that away and put that into its original form the intervals change your attention changes so we have dark dark here 
light, light here, light, light here, light, light here, light. In other words, major value contrast between this area and this area. Ma area, major between here and here, between here and here. Moderate, more moderate between, say, these areas right in here. We have, uh, if we go back into the sky, we're, we'll see moderate to minor. We have, uh, and so our eye doesn't, is not as interested in the sky because the clouds are in value relationship. The clouds are closer into more minor, more minor. This is minor contrast right here. This is more moderate value contrast right here where there are more intervals between the darkest dark and the lightest light within that particular area. Now that we know what we're looking for, let's look once again. Let's obscure some areas again and let you watch. Notice the difference that the actual value of contrast, the degree of contrast makes. If we obscure the boats, we take away the really strong, the darkest dark. We take away the darkest dark and we miss them. If we hadn't seen them, we might be able to adjust and then we would be more interested in the contrast, the, the stronger contrasts that are going on in these areas. But then we take away those areas and it even becomes less interesting and we take away those areas and now we see our, our attention is going back right here. So you see what a difference it makes when you control the value contrast. You are the determiner as to where the eye goes and to, degree, to the degree the eye goes where it goes. We put the contrast, just a little bit of contrast back in. And we see that we, by having this strong contrast, we have a stronger piece. This, we might even be able to live with this interpretation where we have a strong value of contrast, the major contrast we have in here, and the more minor contrast in here, sort of suggesting fog moving in. We take the whole thing out and it totally changes again. If we just take, put this much back in, just put the light back in, we have a different interpretation. So we could play around with that kind of thing all day long, uh, but I think maybe we'll do better if we get right into the lesson. So now it's time for your questions. There we go. Okay, we're back. I'm back. Are you back? So I'm ready for your questions now. Roger, can you give me a screen so I can see the questions? <laughs> there we go. All righty. Ten seconds behind you. Mm-hmm. So, uh, okay, Cheryl says, can you please address how to achieve a high contrast in moderate shadow conditions such as bird feathers uh, that are bright, uh, black and white, but not wanting the eye to go there. Yeah, okay. I wonder if I have an example. I don't have an example. Um, so if you have a bird that's black and white, um, how the light is shining on that bird is going to determine how we see the contrast, how we see the value of contrast in it. So just because a bird's black and white doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to see a high contrast uh, between the blacks and the whites. Now, if the light is shining on the bird in such a way that we do see the blacks and whites, um, that pretty much is going to pull the eye to it unless, I mean, th that is when you describe it, if, if the light is shining on the bird in such a way that the shadows are in places on the bird and its surroundings in ways other than uh, shadows being on the transition between the, the whites and the blacks. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now, 
that's going to show to, in order to show that that contrast one thing that to take into consideration when the light's shining on the black of the bird it won't be black <laughs> now i wish i had some way to illustrate that to you here but you can you can find some way to illustrate it to yourself one way you can illustrate it to yourself is to um, get get something that's um, say a black shirt for example uh, put on a black shirt or, or hang a black shirt on a light wall on a white wall and shine a light directly on the black shirt now what you will see is where the lights hitting that black it's no longer black where the lights hitting hitting it the strongest it's going to turn very light. It's going to fall about a value of five, depending, depending on the re reflectivity of the fabric in the shirt, um, the light's going to change. Uh, James Gurney has a beautiful example, example of that in his book, uh, Light and Color. I think it's on page 48, but I can't be real sure, uh, where, um, where he shows how light shining on something that's black changes the value of it. And so when the light's shining really strongly on the bird that's black and white, uh, the, the light's going to change that black to a different value, to a gray. So ideally, in order to uh, paint that black and white bird, if you want high contrast or major contrast or strong contrast within the bird, it's got to be sitting so that the portion of the bird where the white and the black are together meet are neither in shadow or in strong light. So we've always got to take that light, what the light is doing, into consideration. Um, so if you don't want the eye to go there, and that was the question, if you don't want the eye to go there, uh, then your bird needs to be uh, lit in such a way that the emphasis is not on the contrast of the bird. Now, um, ideally, I would have a picture of a black and white bird here, and I could show you what I'm talking about. Or ideally, I'd have a black and white bird right here with the light shining on it, and could show you exactly what I'm talking about. But always keep in mind that the strength of the light and how the light is shining on anything is going to change its value. The, the inherent, or you might say local value of anything uh, is not indicative of the value that you will paint it. So now let me see. Uh, I hope I, if, uh, that, I'm going to stop there on that one and go on to other questions, hoping I made that, uh, uh, made that clear. If I didn't, ask me another question, Cheryl. Lord, I see a bunch of questions coming up. Oh, I'll catch you one at a time. Just be patient. <laughs> uh, uh, Saren, is value contrast specified to note it's not, is j value specified, is value contrast, c contrast specified to note it's not contrast? I don't really know, I don't understand the question. Saren, could you ask that in a different way so I can understand it? Maybe is value contrast. Is value contrast specified to note it's not, it question is, mark, contrast? It's different than contrast. Huh? Is it different than contrast? Difference in contrast? Yeah, value contrast oh. as opposed to contrast, the regular contrast. Oh, is there? Oh, oh. That might be it. Is that it? Maybe. Well, value of contrast is just one kind of contrast. Uh, we can get contrast in all the visual elements. So, but I don't, I'm not quite sure if that's what you, can you ask that in another way so that maybe I could better understand it? Your mic, you might not be at its top today. Okay, Linda. Uh, please discuss the use of squinting mm -hmm, at the subject to simplify values. Yes. Um, what when when we squint, uh, we shut down. We we shut out some of the value, uh, some of the light rays, sort of off. So when we squint, what we do is we we throw out the details so that we can better compare uh, where the degrees of value. So if you'll notice that when you squint, you can't you can't see sharp edges. So when you can't see sharp edges, uh, you can see values a whole lot better because you don't have those sharp edges interfering. Now I said I said that in several different ways. But as I'm squinting right now and looking at the camera, 
uh, there is uh, something that's light uh, behind the camera. There's a wall that's behind the camera that's white. It's in shadow. And so by squinting, I can see that value comparison. I can see that the camera that I'm looking into itself, because of the way the light, I'm seeing the light, uh, and because of everything being in shadow, I can see that what well, by squinting at it, I can compare it really, really easily, that that is a moderate value contrast, that I'm seeing that white wall fall into about a value five on the value scale, on like this value scale right here. Uh, it's about what I'm looking at on that wall. It's about right here. I can see that when I squint, and I can see that the camera value is about right here, about a value uh, eight or nine. So I can see that. So squinting enables all the details to go away so that you can do value comparison. I uh, hope I did, hope I made, hope I was okay on that one. Um, Linda again. Linda again. Sure. Um, Schmidt says, over modeling and running out of values can be avoided by substituting color changes for value changes when possible. How, how do you know when it's possible? <clears throat> over modeling and running out of values. Uh, well, I think maybe uh, you don't really run out of values. I think what he's, uh, I, th I think what he's really emphasizing there is uh, get, keeping uh, a ver keeping variation. So I'll say I wouldn't worry about running out of values, but I would look at the value comparisons of what you're working with. So if the thing you're looking, at, if the area you're looking at is a large area, uh, say a field or even a wall, or you, you can think of a number of things where there's a large area that appears to be single value. Uh, what you can do there is to alternate warm and cool for your variation. Alter, or you can alternate, not only alternate warm and cool, but you could, uh, if you're looking at the color wheel, you can, uh, it will be sort of the same thing. So if you're color wheel, if you're working, say, in a red-orange, for example, then you can move it a little bit redder in some places and a little bit more orange or a little more yellow in some places. In other words, you have, when you're, work, when you're painting, you have value and you have hue and you have intensity or saturation or chroma, those three words that you're working with. So if you're, if you're in one area, uh, say if you're in one kind of value, one area of value, uh, you, can, you can alternate or, or vary the saturation, the temperature, Temperature is referring to hue, or, or the hue itself. So I wouldn't worry so much about running. I think maybe if um, I need to get into Schmidt and see what context he's saying that, but that, that's the best answer I can give right now, Linda. She had a follow-up question. Follow-up question. I, I, I think it may, he may have explained it already. Okay, uh, please discuss conservation of values versus overmodeling. Oh, okay, okay, okay. To keep the strong design followed by the using color temperature to show the change before we're using the value change. Well, <clears throat> okay, uh, over-modeling simply means that um, you are overworking. Uh, overworking meaning that you are, you're more intent on showing the thing as it is rather than aware of the, how the values are, are working. Um, and so, um, conservation of values, how, how can you say that? In, in my mind, conservation of values means that you don't try to put every little value in that you see. Uh, for example, if, you are, if you're looking at something that's got a whole bunch of textures in it, um, or with something that's, it would begin to make it kind of junky, if you put in everything you see, what the best thing to do is to squint it and average those values out and then select the ones you want to emphasize. You don't need to say, what you used to say, don't say the whole thing completely. And also the, you've heard less is more. And what that means is that you don't try to put every little thing in that you see, but that you pull back 
and you use just enough of what you see, we will say value-wise, <clears throat> you would you would use just enough. You would you would um, generalize a lot of the values that are very very close, and then emphasize those that are mo most important. I hope I wasn't too fuzzy on that, but maybe I. Oh, the color temperature. Well, color temperature is something that uh, lives within the value areas. So you, you always have that option in color temperature, no matter what the value is, you always have that option to, to, to vary the color temperature, alternate color temperature, uh, which is a really good thing to do to keep uh, a richness in, in your colors. And so I wouldn't worry too much, uh, just as long as you're sure that when you change the temperature, you don't also change the value. That can happen easily because usually when we change the temperature, we're going to reach for, uh, a, um, well, if we're changing from a warm to a cool, we're, we might reach for a, a darker color. Well, that needs to be value corrected to the value you're working with uh, before you reach into it, else you'll change the value. So my, I guess my warning there is just be careful when you're, when you're changing temperature, that you're working with temperature, that you don't change the value when you change the temperature. Um, Laura. Laura, would you please discuss when in the painting pro process value contrast occurs? I'm thinking it slowly develops. Laura, it occurs from the very beginning. Now, when we're speaking, of, you know, I was trying to point out to you in the introduction video that we have all those degrees of contrast that we're working in, and they are caused primarily by how the light is, what kind of light you have, and how that light is, how those light rays are hitting the subject, where the light is located, all time of day, all those kinds of things. Is it a direct light? You're going to have much stronger contrast in direct light uh, than you're going to have in diffused light. Overcast days, you don't have anything like the value contrast that you have when the light is a direct light. Now, um, process, yeah. From the very, very beginning, you're, you take value contrast in consideration. The first value, the first contrast you take in consideration is that overall field of shadow with the overall field of light. Because within the overall field of shadow, uh, that's where your major dark structure is going to be in the painting. In the overall field of light, you may have some darks, but the major structure of the darks uh, are going to be in those areas that are in shadow. Now there can be areas in shadow that are overlapping areas in light. So uh, I would say from the very beginning, uh, it's a good idea to be aware of the value contrast that's there and control the contrast as you go. Uh, where, uh, where you see minor contrast, keep it minor where you see moderate contrast, keep it moderate. Where you see major contrast, hold back just a little bit and wait till towards the end of the painting before you put in really strong, um, determinative value contrast. And those contrasts that you put in towards the end of the painting are going to be the ones that guide the eye, going to be the ones that pull the eye in. So uh, I wouldn't make firm, I, I don't think it's a good idea to make really firm decisions about the con value contrast. Um, uh, well, you certainly need to make those firm decisions about light and shadow, how the whole thing falls in light and in shadow. But I think that the value contrast has always, a kind of contrast has always got to be in consideration throughout the entire painting. Um, Laura had a part two. Part two I, of Laura? Already, you may have already discussed it. But. Developed throughout is adjusted. Oh, I'm think. oh, I see. I'm thinking it slowly develops. <laughs> I do, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't see that second part of that question. You're right. It slowly develops uh, and, and you adjust it towards the end of the process. And that's where you make those final decisions at the end of the process. No matter what the subject is, uh, your major consideration is where have you placed that emphasis uh, and where have you, uh, remember the uh, guiding the eye uh, lessons that we had where you, 
you subdue certain areas and those are the areas that are mostly in minor contrast and in some cases moderate moderate to minor. pointed that out in the video the first the uh, introduction video uh yeah but it, yeah you develop it and then you put that final contrast towards the end okay sarah and again sarah, it, yeah. is there a contrast that's not value contrast <laughs> yes <laughs> uh well roger said that's what you meant sarah uh Okay, good. Yes. Um, oh, yes. There are all kinds of, all the visual elements have contrast. Just think about it. We have size contrast, small against large. You have shape contrast, uh, organic against uh, geometric shapes, or round against square, and that sort of thing. You have directional contrast, uh, horizontal against vertical, diagonal against counter diagonal. Uh, you have texture contrast. Bid busy, busy against smooth, 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 uh, that sort of thing. Um, you have line contrast, thick against thin. Uh, I'm trying to think of all the visual elements. I'm trying to pull them off the top of my head. But every single visual element has ability to be contrasted. If you think about that, it's not that contrast is something you do that is a result. Uh, and, and what happens on the canvas or your paper is the result of what you did so you're it's the contrast is not there it's not something that you're that you're achieve, trying to achieve but it's something that you do you contrast in order to create contrast now i hope that wasn't too confusing but i always like to think of these principles as verbs not nouns so you think of contrast as it, first it's a verb in order to be a noun in order to function visually the way you want it to function it's got to be a verb. So give that some thought. <laughs> okay. Elaine, Elaine can, you give, uh, can you give tips for using a red or blue filter? Green. Uh, yeah, sorry, I can't yeah. read. <laughs> red or green filter to determine values. Uh, brought, bought, I bought a set, but haven't used them as well. They do help, the red filter especially, but it reduces the lightness of the value. Now, it will help. Just, it, what the red filter does, it just takes out, it, it, it takes out color. When you look through any filter, it, alter, it alters the color. So the red filter takes out color uh, and, uh, and makes things appear in values, pretty much. But you have to be careful. You don't get a true comparison, especially if it's a dark red filter. And I've seen, I've seen these filters come in various uh, lightnesses and darknesses. It's better to have, if you're going to going to use a red filter it's better to have one that's not really really dark one that is uh red but um thin enough or, or transparent enough so that it doesn't make everything go dark but um you you're able to compare your values but we just remember usually when you're looking through that that red filter it's going to make those lights feel a lot lighter than they really are so it is helpful but I would say it, it, it's better to use it as a crutch in the beginning, but then let it teach you how to look for values and don't depend upon it. <clears throat> That's my advice. I'm not saying it's gospel, but I'm just saying it's my advice. Um, okay, wh who's next? Where? Uh, Cheryl says, thank you. And then Linda had about edge contrast. Oh, I see hard, down there. Yeah. Hard versus soft. Uh, hard, edge contrast, hard versus soft. Oh, yes, that's another kind of contrast. Thanks, Linda. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you've been reading Richard Schmidt, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, edge contrast. That's another contrast. Yeah, hard. Uh, well, there's um, Marco Bucci. Uh, if, you, if you haven't discovered much of Marco Bucci on, on uh, YouTube, you need to discover him because he, he has a wonderful understanding of uh, color, but he's primarily a digital painter. Which is really, really uh, good too, because that shows you uh, what can be done with digital painting. But he, the principles are the same, no matter. Um, but anyway, um, he he uses the terms hard, firm, soft, and loss for edges for contrast. And I think that's not a bad thing because the really hard con hard edges will also be evident where there is the strongest or the most major value contrast. So, so if you have a really sharp edge that's light over here, a really sharp edge that's black over here, that's a really, really sharp edge. But then if you have, if that white edge is, uh, say, uh, more of a moderate, val more of a middle value, the edge doesn't feel as sharp. He, he will call that firm, 
rather than sharp, just making the distinction between the two words. And of course, the soft edge we know, we all know about. That's the edge is slightly fuzzy, soft. And of course, the lost edge is no edge at all. Uh, that's gradation, which we'll be addressing next time. So, okay, good, Linda. Thank you, Linda. How about working in grayscale only to really get this? Yeah, I think so. Um, if um, if you use something like this, and you see what, I don't know if you can see what I've got here. I have a grayscale. Uh, I need to put this up on the website for you, this particular one. I have several value scales on the website. And also, I'll tell you another good one that you probably already have. This one. This is, uh, is the, it's called the gray grayscale and value finder. Uh, this is available in all the art stores, I think. But here's, here's what you can do. That, that is very, very helpful. You can hold this, and you have to be sure when, when you're using these things, you've got to be sure that what you're looking at here is in the same light as what you're looking at through it. But you can hold it up like this, and as you can see, uh, uh, you can see the, let's get it up, mm, well, let's get it sort of over the grass here. You can see, you can see that, um, let's see, let's put it over here. If I got it behind the grass, well, you can't really tell, can you? <laughs> <laughs> the problem here is there's a time lag. What I'm trying to get you to do is to look through those little holes into the background there. And you see how you see the variation of the value? You see, uh, now, if, if I pull the scale over, uh, if I say pull the scale over, you can see, uh, you can see through the scale, you can see the comparisons through the scale of the images you see behind you. Uh, so you you can see if I can put a little far enough, uh, it's difficult for me to tell here. Um, and you can do you can do this. You can use something like this to hold in front of you, where you can adjust the scale by moving it around and s finding the various values you're looking at and determining by what's on the scale uh, which value range those values are in. So uh, you know, get it closer to the fox right in here. And you can, you can see there, as I move that up and down, you can see, and if I turn it upside down, move it up and down, you can see the comparison there between the, uh, the fox uh, and my head. But anyway, <laughs> that, that one um, is very, very helpful, very, very helpful, and will help you to learn to register uh, we, we, it helps you learn to register values as you see them with, and then you eventually be able to put this thing down and you'll be able to look at a value and, and instantly be able to register it. There's something I need to say here, need to explain here. Um, and that is when you, the value scales in their numbering, I've explained this in a number, a number of times in a number of different places, but the way the value scales are numbered can be confusing. Um, and I won't go into why, there's a, there's a long explanation as to why, but um, originally when the value scales came out, value one right here, right over here, value one, uh, about the lightest value was value one, the darkest value was value 10. Now that is how I learned to associate numbers with values. Then later on, uh, they switched that around. Even these scales, when they first came out, were numbered that way. And then the next batch of scales I got some time ago, maybe 10, 10 years or so, maybe maybe a little bit more, maybe more like 15 years ago. Anyway, all of a sudden I noticed those numbers were switched. And the, the black was now called number one, and the white was called number 10. Now, I won't go into why. I do know why, but you can look that up. And so if I'm talking, I, I can't switch my thinking. I've been thinking of black in terms of 10 associated with the numbers. I've been thinking that way all my life, and I can't make that switch. And so you just have to get used to that in the way I might call a number that's on the value scale. Uh, if, you, if you're accustomed to thinking as white as 10, then I'm sorry. That, that's just what these people do to us, these people who are out there determining how things should be. <laughs> So I just wanted to throw that out as far as the scale is concerned. Um, okay, what was next? Um, how about working the grayscale? Oh, is there nothing else that's come up? Have I lost folks? No, that's it.
Is that the end of it? Is everybody still with us? Yeah. <laughs> uh, concerning the um, value scale, uh, oh, back to this value finder again. Uh, one thing, one thing that you might study, which is a lot of fun to study. Remember, I, I, early in the beginning, we were talking. I was talking about the uh, how the way light shines on something is going to determine its value, no matter what its internal value is, like a black shirt, I keep going back to that, or anything's black, you shine the light on it, it changes its value. And one good way to, to study that is to look at, uh, look through these holes on, on this particular one of things that are not in shadow, in those areas where there are light rays in some way hitting them. Uh, whether they're diffused light rays or whether they are direct light rays. And, and then you begin to feel this more as the light side of the value scale and this more as the shadow side of the value scale. So I think it's a good idea to associate uh, light and shadow. So are you, have you run out of questions? I don't see any more questions coming in. Are they still with us? Uh, 112 are. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Um, one way that, uh, one thing I would like to, let's see, here comes one. Uh, uh, Linda. Linda says, I see some painters make a pile of gray in the value they want first and then add color. Comment. <sighs> well, okay. Okay. Um, I don't like that idea. <laughs> Maybe that's the best way to say it. Because it just uh, changing the value, just, uh, just mixing your color by adding a different value of white or, 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 or different values of gray to it changes the intensity of the color. You have better control over the intensity of the color if you don't do that, it, but if you if you rather to change the intensity of the color, depend upon the complementary side of the color wheel uh, for changing the intensity of the color. So that's not a practice that I condone, and I've never seen a painting done that way that really had nice brilliant color. Now that is a tonalist approach to painting, and so if you're more interested in tonalism than you are in color. A color relationship, oh, that might work okay, but it's not something. Uh, it's not something I would recommend. It, 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 so I'll just stop it. I'll just stop it there uh, on that one. Hi, Alka. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. Well, while we're waiting for you to come up, okay. Here comes another one. <clears throat> when mixing paint, I've heard to mix the value first, then worry about mixing the color. Is that right? Um, let me say it, it's right to a point. Let me say it in a different way. You need to decide. No, 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 no. You, you, uh, you determine the color, determine what the color is going to be first, and then you adjust the value of the color. Uh, otherwise, um, it's going to be difficult to find the color. So my, I'm thinking it's safer. My, in my experience, is safer when you first look at something to determine the general hue that you're looking at. Determine that first, and then the value. For mixing, you should always, when you're mixing two colors together, uh, you should always mix, mix two colors of the same value. So if you have colors like uh, uh, yellow and, well, let me say that a little bit differently. If you have colors like cadmium yellow light, which is one of the lightest hues we have coming out of a tube, and let me see if I can think of a dark. Yeah, if you have then, if you have a color like uh, I'll just say one sap green, which is a dark color coming out of the tube, and if you wanted to, um, you want to make that uh, cadmium yellow light. You're in that cadmium yellow light range, but it's more yellow green. You want to add just a little bit of the sap green to it. If you want to, if you want to change that color without changing the value, you need to value correct the sap green first. 
Now sometimes if when you're mixing like that, like if you want to change the color of sap green with, uh, with a chamomile light, um, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need to do anything to chamomile light because you add just a little bit into it, it's going to change it. But there's no way it's going to, uh, and there's no way when you add lots of chamomile light into it, it's going to change the color and the value. So what I'm thinking about that is always be conscious when you're mixing color. Always be conscious of how one color you're mixing is affecting the value of the color you're mixing to, into it. Um, let's see. Serendipity. Seren serendipity. Oh, why didn't I see that first? <laughs> I thought that was two names and the person's first name was Saren. <laughs> <laughs> Serendipity. That's clever. <laughs> All right. Um, th does Darker Valia, do, do dark, Darker values always appear to recede from lighter, oh, here we go, lighter values, presuming all else remains constant? I always hesitate to say always to anything. I would say in space, in space, that might not be right. Uh, because if I'm looking at, uh, if I'm looking, if I'm looking out at a, at, at a scene of Vista and I have uh, mountains, we have a lot of those around here. <laughs> if I have mountains going into the distance, they are gradually getting lighter as they're going in the distance. But if I'm standing right next to a tree trunk, a tree trunk is, if it, and if I'm standing, if I'm standing in the shade under a tree trunk, and I'm looking out at the mountains, huh? Under a tree trunk? No, no, under a tree. Okay. <laughs> Beside a tree. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I'm standing in the yeah. shade beside a tree trunk, in front, looking out at a vista of mountains, those mountains are receding and they're getting lighter as they're going in the distance and that tree trunk is dark. Now what do you think about that? Does that tree trunk feel like it's receding into distance? So I know that folks will say that. Uh, darker values always appear to recede in the distance than lighter values. I know folks will say that, but it, it ain't always so. So I would say, depend upon your observation for that. Um, Bill, I recently viewed a YouTube video by James Gurney, one of my favorite people, uh, where he creates one or two neutrals for several tube colors. One or two neutrals for several tube colors? Comments. Um, what was he doing there? One of two neutrals for... One or two. Or several tube colors. Are you? I guess maybe you're talking about referring back to my earlier comment about mixing uh, neutrals in order to uh, uh, mixing neutrals to reach into the neutrals. But he, what he's doing there is he's neutralizing. I think I understand what you're saying there, uh, where he's where he'll have the neutrals and he's using the neutrals to neutralize a highly saturated hue, which is okay. Uh, I mean, that's not... that Probably get them all to the same value. Yeah. That, that, that's a little different from the way I understood the other question to be asked. Uh, so, so uh, what, let's, but I, I, let me explain something like this. A neutral is all colors. And the more neutral a color is, of course, we know the more gray it is, that we know that when a color gets totally neutralized, it has no hue in it anymore. I'm talking about color now, not value contrast, but that, that's the question. <laughs> so I'll answer it. Uh, in essence, then, when, when, I, when you are, have neutralized a color, you have all colors going for you. Any gray, any neutral, and scientifically, is a combination of all hues. And so um, it's, it's, it works very, very well if you have a highly saturated hue to, uh, to neutralize it with a gray that you have mixed. Um, there are exceptions. I did, didn't I do something on that somewhere? Didn't, do I have a quick tip about that or did I do a weekend, one of the weekend newsletter tips? I did something with that recently. That um, there are some colors though that are richer 
uh, when to, to be neutralized, or richer when they're neutralized by their complement. And, and uh, we can see also that in the very, very dark values, uh, we don't notice the loss of hue so much uh, when we neutralize with grays. So yes, watch James Gurney. He knows what he's doing. So I don't, the, the only place I have an argument about James is I can't agree with the, his color wheel, but that's okay. That's okay. James, James is one of my favorite artists, one of my favorite people. Um, I don't know. I kind of stumble over that one. Bill, forgive me if I stumble too much, but uh, that's just the way it is. Um, Serendipity, thank you so much. Apologies for newbiness. <laughs> there's no make any apologies for newbiness. <laughs> Welcome to the world of newbiness. Everybody's a newbie in some way. Okay, Jenny, how many value intervals do we need to create form? Ah, oh, like painting an apple. Ah. Oh. Well, okay, then we get into value intervals versus value gradations. Now, uh, gradations, you, you see in forms like apples, round forms, you're going to see the transition, gradual transition of dark to light, light to dark, dark to light, light, that move with the form of the round thing you're looking at. There will, if, if there are, uh, depending on where the light is, between where, where the light source is located, you might have a slight gap between the light side of that and the dark side of that, and, uh, and that little transition is called a terminator. Uh, but there is no limit, or there is no, there's no set number of values that you need in order to show, uh, in order to create form. What creates form, uh, one thing that creates form, it's the gradation of value that creates what we mean form. If you mean form, I assume that you're meaning roundness, rounded shapes and so on. So it's the gradation of the form, uh, the gradation of values that create the form means the gradual change uh, from one value to another. So there's no number there. Use your observation, depending, once again, it depends upon what kind of light it's in. If it's in a strong light, you're going to have a wider range of values. If it's in a uh, diffused light, you'll have not quite so wide range of values. So um, I would say that, again, you have to depend upon your observation. I think the radius of the form, too. Would the radius of the form, yeah. It was sharp or gradual. Yeah, change. yeah, the, 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 depending on the shape of the form, the radius, all those kinds of things. Uh, but, uh, um, okay, maybe I, there is no answer to that one, Jenny. Mm -hmm. You have to use your observation. There is no, uh, how many intervals? Um, and, and, oh, and maybe it, I did say that, didn't I? You don't really see the change of the intervals. Uh, it's one interval merging. It's the lost edge thing. It's one interval merging into the other. One interval gradually changing to the next interval, gradually changing to the next interval. It's kind of like, hey, I like this. I like this comparison. You always like to compare painting with uh, music, and uh, when you when you see can see value differences, like if you have uh, foliage or anything, and you can see one distinct value beside another. That's kind of like the piano keyboard. You know where the two there, you have two notes together. There's an interval between each of those notes, and and so uh, and you can see that. But I like to compare that with. Uh, the gradation, like uh, if you if you're playing something like a violin, and you're able to take your finger on the violin because a violin does not have frets like a guitar does, and you and you're able to take your finger on the violin string and pull it down and hear that that it, you don't hear the intervals change like you do in a like you do in a piano when you when you uh, have two notes that you're going from one note to another, you can enter, hear the intervals change. It's the same thing, gradation versus contrast. Okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> yes, Bill says yes. Okay. Other questions? I, I want to show you, while, you're, while we're wait, waiting, we, time's going to be up very, very shortly. Well, we've got about four minutes, four minutes. left. four minutes left here. Yeah. Okay, so 
Get your questions ready. Again, if you got more questions, get them in because I'm signing off in four minutes. <laughs> I, I want to show you one little thing. I've got uh, Richard Schmidt's book here. Um, I always, everybody, you know, you should know by now, most of you should know by now that uh, I have a high, high regard for Richard Schmidt's work as an artist that uh, uh, I think in our generation he is the artist that's going to remember, going to be remembered as, as the greatest artist in that generation. Um, it will not, the story won't be told for several, probably a couple more generations now, but uh, that's, that's how I feel about Richard Schmidt's work as him as an artist. But um, in his book, and I have it here, and I'm going to try to show you what I'm talking about. I, I want to show you just one example, or maybe I can show you a comparison of how he uses the value contrast, value, the degree of value contrast, uh, to guide your eye through the work in maybe a surprising way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, this is a big heavy book. It's almost bigger than I am, but I'm just going to kind of hold it up here and try to get in front of the camera and show you. Let's see if I can do that without a glare. See if I can kind of show you what, what you can look. Now, I want you to look at this big, strong value contrast right over here. And now, does that not defy what your teachers have told you? <laughs> Let me move my fingers out of the way here. Uh, move it away. Move it away. Move it away. Maybe. Okay. Okay. That's better. Is that better? Can Can you see? Can you see now? Can you see uh, what I've got there? Watch what he does there. He's got that really strong value contrast right over here, and watch how he pulls your eye. He's got another value contrast here. That we might call this one over here major. Watch. He's got moderate. These are moderate against the sky. Uh, these are in their minor against each other. These values right in here. Now, watch what he, he comes right in here and get a tiny little bit of major. Major right in here. These two. That pulls your eye in here. And then we get here. This is more moderate against the sky there. And then he pulls you right on over here. Pulls you uphill here. He's got enough in space of all this stuff going on here to balance this big strong. Now this may not be as strong in his original painting. Uh, the, the, the book may have it, uh, the, the printing process may have made it a little bit stronger than it is. But look, all this in here is minor. Huh? It's see-through. All the green is see-through. Oh. <laughs> oh, the, the green's showing through. I'm sorry, but they just have to do... Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> green it's screen. the green screen show. Oh dear. Oh dear. Oh dear. That's just not working, is it? We we have to show that as a slide. That is really unfortunate. <laughs> well, I'm going to close the book now. What you just saw was technology at work. <laughs> I'm showing you something there, and I didn't realize it because I couldn't see. I could only see in the camera. <laughs> and you're probably wondering what the heck is going on. <laughs> Uh, but uh, what was happening there? We're using the green screen. That's the reason you can see this fox behind me. And uh, <laughs> does it shut? Does that doesn't work? The the sky showed up in the tree. The sky showed sky That's in the tree showed up. Front. But everything that was green in that painting was transparent. <laughs> well, that shows you technology. So you didn't really get to see. If you have Richard Schmidt's book, you know which painting painting I'm talking about. And of course, he's got the. That he's got that sort of usage of minor, major, and moderate value contrast throughout in all of his paintings, so you can watch out for that. Um, but even in, in this slide behind me, I'm going over just a little bit. Just going, I just want to talk about that a little bit. Even in, in the slide in the slide behind me, uh, what I want you to notice is those degrees of contrast. That in let me get my finger up here. Uh, which side is that? I have to wait for 30 seconds. So in the grass areas, am I backwards? Can you tell? You haven't come up yet. I haven't come up yet. We're, we have a 30 second delay. There we go. In these areas, right here I am, right here. Okay. Can you see there's major contrast between the back of a fox and that foxhole behind him? Major contrast between those grasses 
and that hole behind him. But I want you to look through those green grasses behind him. And I want you to look at those grasses that are inside the, that hole. You see the minor contrast there? Or it's minor to moderate. That's the effect of shadow. That shows you what happens in shadow because the major, the grasses in front are catching light and they're showing that major contrast between the shadow areas behind it uh, and then the, the grasses that are inside the little foxhole behind there. Those are uh, in shadow. They would be catching just as much light if they were in front. In fact, you can see some of those dead grasses in front there that they're catching just as much light. There is a prime example of how light affects, how the light source is going to affect the degree of value and, to, and going to affect uh, the light source shining on something that's in front of something that's in shadow behind it is going to show you the effect that what's in front of it uh, is going to be much more highly contrasted with what's behind it than it would if it were if the whole thing were in shadow. Okay, um, it, or is there one more, I'll, I'll take one more question. If I see one coming, thank you, Diane. This has been really helpful. Good, thank Jenny. you, Johnny. <coughs> like great foxes. chat, Diane. You look awesome, <laughs> little fox. <laughs> I know the fox ears right behind me. <laughs> I know <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Well, anyway, so Roger did that on purpose to me. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome for the chat. All of you, thank you for joining us. Uh, you just don't know how much we appreciate all of you being members. And it's, it's really a lot of fun to work with you every third Sunday. And so uh, that's it for now. Go out into the world and paint wonderful value contrasts. So bye-bye for now.